Thank you for joining us for another Grassroots Health webinar, Scientists Answer Your Questions, this one on vitamin D and pregnancy. Um, this week, we're airing an interview between Dr. Carol Wagner and Grassroots Health Director Carol Baggerly, and we'll follow with questions and answers on vitamin D and pregnancy. Dr. Carol Wagner is a professor of medicine at the, at the Medical University of South Carolina, a neonatologist and pediatrician, and noted vitamin D researcher. She has published many studies on vitamin D as it relates to pregnancy, breastfeeding, and children, including a recent randomized clinical trial demonstrating the safety and effectiveness of vitamin D during pregnancy. In that publication, she quotes, vitamin D supplementation of 4,000 IU per day for pregnant women is safe and most effective in achieving sufficiency in all women and their neonates regardless of race. The current estimated average requirement is comparatively ineffective. And here we go, enjoy the talk. Welcome to DFACS, a publication of the D-Action Project of Grassroots Health. We are bringing you very specific vitamin D information for your health. Today we have with us Dr. Carol Wagner from the Medical University of South Carolina, who has just been working on a study about pregnant women and their babies. And of course, they also have a study in progress on lactating women. And today we're gonna to hear about some of the very exciting results from those studies. Dr. Wagner, thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you, it's my pleasure to be here. And we always love to hear good things about vitamin D, and I already know that some of the information is outstanding. Well, thank you. We, we are really excited about it. Tell me, from your standpoint, what one or two of the most exciting pieces of information are. Well, the first, probably the most important, um, was uh, to give women up to 4,000 international units, and we found that it's safe and effective in raising their levels. Uh, much more so than what we find with 400 international units. And um, in this randomized control trial, women were randomized to 400, 2,000, and 4,000 international units. So we found that they're safe. The 4,000, both 2,000 and 4,000 were safe, and um, also lowered uh, rates of infection and preterm labor, preterm birth. Two things there I want to highlight, uh, or confirm anyway. The 400 international units is currently what is recommended for pregnant women, is it not? It is, and it was thought for decades to be the effective therapy. Yes, and what did you find with 400? 400 is an inconsequential dose. Fantastic. I mean, just, just that alone, knowing that the 400 isn't going to cut it. It's not enough to make a difference. Okay, one of the things that you mentioned um, was that there was a significant reduction in various instances of during the pregnancy with the 4000 IU. You mentioned what some of those things are, please. We looked at a number of factors, mm -hmm. uh, we call them variables, that would potentially have been affected by vitamin D, okay. such as infections, any infections, preterm labor, and or preterm birth, diabetes, preeclampsia, uh, hypertension. Right. So all of those, uh, of all of those factors in these very healthy women, they had to be very healthy to be in the study. There were 350 women who completed the study, 510 women started the study. And they were randomized to these three treatment groups. What we found was lower rates of overall infection in the 4,000 international unit group, uh, lower rates of preterm labor and preterm birth. And then when we looked at all of those co comorbidities that I talked about, mm -hmm. we found that the rate of those uh, basically um, adverse events during pregnancy mm -hmm. were half uh, in the 4,000 IU group compared to the 400. <laughs> That still makes me smile. I just can't believe, I mean, I can believe it, but it's like, that is an enormous difference. Did that surprise you? Yes, it really <laughs> did. <laughs> we, we were really, our main goal was to show safety. Yes. And so we were, 
um, the word equipoised throughout the study. We were blinded to the treatment group, and mm -hmm. so we, it was locked away in another, in another building. And um, it's only recently that we've been able to have the data from our you know, data, yes. data an analyzing group. And so these findings are really, I think, a, a small revolution. I think they're a big revolution. I really do. Because if, to me, from my point of view, and you, our listeners out there, if we can prevent disease starting from birth, that gives that human being a much greater power throughout their whole life, does it not? Exactly. All right. I have another question about the, um, the different treatment groups and the serum levels. Our panel, which you are part of, recommends that we have between 40 and 60 nanograms per ml as a target serum level. What did you find as a measured serum level with these people that were better off? So in the 4,000 international unit group, um, we found uh, the level was around 49 on the mean level. And in the 2,000 international group, and this is nanograms per ml, mm -hmm. um, it was about 42, and the 400 group was below 30. Fantastic. Which is not surprising. Right, right, right. So part of the real message, the real take-home thing now that you would recommend very securely to any pregnant woman is? That she needs to have her level checked. That's number one. Sure. And number two, uh, on the basis of uh, our findings, we're recommending that pregnant women are prescribed 4,000 international units a day. And uh, if a woman is a sun sunbather and uh, or goes to a tanning bed, that sort of thing, and she has a level that's you know, easily in the 40 to 60 range, then no, she wouldn't need supplementation. Sure. And that's why it's important at this point mm -hmm. uh, to get levels because, you know, maybe in 20 years when we've studied hundreds of thousands of women, we'll know and we'll say yes, of course, under these circumstances. But right now, um, we recommend levels and we think... By recommending levels, you mean recommending a testing? For a yes, level, right? exactly. Okay. Sure. Yes, thanks sure. for clarifying yeah, that. And, and 4,000 okay. international okay. units a day. Talk. And again, thank you very much, Dr. Wagner, for coming. Absolutely. And for all this exciting information, and thank we'll be you. talking with you more. Thanks. Thanks, and thanks to all of you for coming. You can find out more information on our Grassroots Health website, www.grassrootshealth.net. We had an entire set of questions for Dr. Wagner today, so I think that we will just proceed. Number one, uh, which is right there, is can you comment on the effects, positive or negative, of taking 4,000 IU of vitamin D per day as part of a regimen before getting pregnant? Would this theoretically increase the chances of getting pregnant, or would there be a negative impact? So we did not study in our uh, two pregnancy studies women before they got pregnant. So the, those studies began at 12 weeks of gestation. However, the Institute of Medicine um, does uh, list 4,000 IU as uh, safe as the upper limit that they, um, so you really are not, um, even with the most conservative uh, measures, um, you can safely take 4,000 international units a day. There are anecdotal um, reports that women who have difficulty getting pregnant can benefit from having a therapeutic um, or actually a normal range vitamin D um, level. So that would be your cir total circulating 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And we have, an, and there are some studies that are just coming out that have looked at infertility and vitamin D deficiency with an association of improved fertility. Um, however, the whole issue of fertility is, um, is multifactorial. And I would urge you to normalize your vitamin D level. Uh, with, we would prefer to have that to be at least 40 to 50 nanograms per ml in that range. And 
I would, um, you know, and then certainly depending on why, you know, you're having difficulty getting pregnant, um, that there are other issues besides vitamin D status. I would say that during pregnancy we had absolutely no safety um, issues um, associated with the 4,000 IU per day in any of our pregnant women. And in fact, <clears throat> there was always a trend in the NICHD trial and in the Thrasher where there were fewer complications of pregnancy associated with the higher dose group of 4,000 compared to, in the NICHD trial, 2,400. And we also found as a function of 25-hydroxy vitamin D achieved that we did see reduction in preterm labor, preterm birth, and infection. Um, that was notable in the Thrasher Research Fund study and also held up when we combined the data sets uh, for a paper that's now in press. Um, in the Journal of Steroid and Biochemistry. I All right. Cannot, Excuse me, I, I can't really think of any negative impact of being vitamin D replete. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, I've had multiple early miscarriages. Don't go beyond five to six weeks. Is it possible that I'm low in vitamin D and this could be causing these early miscarriages or be causing low progesterone? I, I think that that is possible, and I would urge you to have your uh, total circulating, your 25-hydroxy vitamin D level checked. But as I mentioned, there are, there are multiple reasons for infertility and miscarriages. I would also make sure that you've had genetic testing um, because it may be that the early miscarriages, um, it could be a, a genetic uh, reason for that. Um, but certainly... Um, no one should be vitamin D deficient. Um, for what you know, for whatever reason, we shouldn't see that. We should aim to have vitamin D sufficiency, um, just like you wouldn't want to be um, deficient with thyroxin, if you know, in, as far as your thyroid, or you wouldn't want to have low levels of niacin in your body. Um, so this is also true of vitamin D. Um, the only issue, of course, is that because we've evolved um, as humans using the sun to generate the vast majority, more than 90% of our vitamin D comes from the sun unless you take a supplement, um, all the other nutrients you can get through your diet. Unfortunately, with vitamin D, unless you're on a supplement or you go out in the sun, you cannot get enough uh, from your diet. And so what we're seeing is just mass vitamin D deficiency throughout the world. Uh, but I would urge you, anyone, to have their vitamin D level checked. What is vitamin D doing in the placenta? That's a big one. So it's, <laughs> That's a very big one. And <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you that vitamin D is everywhere. It's not only in the placenta. But what happens is the um, vitamin D is converted to 25-hydroxy vitamin D, including in the placenta, and that it <clears throat> is transferred to the fetus. So the fetus actually makes, converts the 25-hydroxy vitamin D to 125-dihydroxy uh, vitamin D. So that's the active metabolite of vitamin D. And it is really essential. What we also know is that in women who, so throughout pregnancy, your active form of 125 is about two and a half to three times what it is in the non-pregnant state. And it, it appears that the placenta is responsible for increasing your 125 slightly, but it appears that most of the 125 is being made from the kidney, um, in the kidney. And um, we're just beginning to understand the role of 125 during pregnancy. We think it has something to do with immune tolerance of the fetus, um, but um, certainly more research needs to take place. Um, and in our study that we're just beginning, um, funded by the Kellogg Foundation, we will be looking at uh, that very question. What is vitamin D doing in the placenta? So stay tuned. <laughs> what reference range do you use for pregnant women as lab values? What's the up lim upper limit of supplement dosage you recommend in pregnancy? And what dangers are associated with a pregnant, pregnant woman's being 
below normal with vitamin D. Okay, so the, the reference range for pregnant women, um, what we showed in our NICHD trial that was published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, um, Dr. Hollis was the lead author on that, and he's my colleague. Um, but what we found in the 350 women who completed the trial was that um, in order to optimize the conversion of 25-hydroxyvitamin D to 125, which is the active hormone, a woman needs to have a level of at least 40 nanograms per ml. Therefore, during pregnancy, we urge you to take the amount of vitamin D, whether you or to have sunlight exposure again, you have to weigh the possible deleterious effects of, of sunlight. Um, but however you get your vitamin D, whether it's through supplement or sunlight exposure, we recommend during pregnancy especially that your level is at least 40 nanograms per ml. So what are the dangers associated with a pregnant woman's vitamin D levels being below that? We certainly have evidence in the literature that vitamin D deficiency is linked with um, states like uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension um, and more severe aspects of that, preeclampsia, which is essentially a vasculitis where you um, have hypertension, you start losing protein, you have renal um, and liver dysfunction. And uh, while we saw a trend in our two studies, um, we were not powered for um, preeclampsia, but we certainly saw, based on 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels, that the risk of preterm labor, so spontaneous preterm labor, um, preterm birth, and infection was higher in those women who had levels that were lower. So for every 10 nanograms per ml that you increase your vitamin D level, we saw a reduction in the rates of those um, disease states. So I would urge every pregnant woman and those women who are planning to get pregnant to have a level of at least 40 nanograms per ml. And Number five, last, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. The, and then they were asking about what was the upper limit of the supplement dosage. Yes. So it really, it really, um, the data suggests that um, you should be able to um, uh, achieve vitamin D sufficiency um, on a supplement, daily supplement, below 10,000. We didn't, we have not studied 10,000, we've studied 4,000. And all the women that we studied were able to achieve a level, if they took their vitamin D supplement, of at least 40 nanograms per ml. I would say, though, that there are going to be some women, who, especially those women who have inflammatory processes, um, obesity, higher um, BMIs, if they have malabsorption, if they have like Crohn's disease or um, ulcerative colitis, they may need higher amounts of vitamin D to achieve those levels. And so that becomes essential to get your levels. And, and I think and the message is very clear that what we are trying to achieve is what the serum level is and essentially to take the dosage necessary to get there. Exactly. Right. On number five, I think you've already answered the first part of that, but they talked about also what's the optimal cord blood level? So uh, the cord blood level, it's about 70% of the mothers. <clears throat> and so um, <clears throat> we don't really know what's optimal in the newborn, but we do know that if a mom's level is, is at least 40, that her, her baby, her newborn baby's level will be at least 20 nanograms per ml conservatively. And, you know, we will probably have a much better idea of that in the next five years with more studies. Um, but we can say that at least 20 nanograms per ml is, is the goal. And some people would even think that, they're, that it should be at least 30 uh, nanograms per ml. Through the winter months, uh, what do you feel is an adequate vitamin D level for a pregnant mother to have in order to deliver a healthy baby? And what doses of vitamin D should be taking and what type? So is there a difference is, in the winter? No. I mean, what it means is certainly 
depending on where you live, if you are at the equator, um, winter months don't really make such a difference. However, even in sunny South Carolina, we're at latitude 32 degrees north, we have seasonal variation so that your levels um, in, your, in your blood are going to be much, uh, usually about 10, 10 nanograms per ml higher during the spring and summer months compared to the winter. However, if you never go outside or if you um, apply sunscreen, then you're not going to see the seasonal variation. And it doesn't matter what time of year, you should have at least, when you're pregnant, at least 40 nanograms per ml is, is what you should aim to achieve. And I would really prefer to see that in place before you get pregnant so that you're entering your first part of, of pregnancy with a, a, a normal level. What do doses of vitamin D should, be, should a woman be taking during pregnancy? Um, so we showed in both of our studies that 4,000 international units a day was safe, and it's effective. Um, what type? We studied um, the vitamin D3, which is cholecalciferol, and in some individuals that appears to be um, better in the conversion from uh, from uh, to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So, and it's also the most readily available. Um, so that that's really um, the answer to number six. All right. Number seven is it okay to supplement with high levels of vitamin D in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy? Well, it depends and on I what you mean I'm by high levels of vitamin D. So, good point. you know, so what we're really saying is you need to have a normal vitamin D level in your blood. And um, so, really, it, if now if you've been very, very deficient, and you suddenly start taking 4,000 international units, you will see a tremendous increase in your vitamin D levels if you were to check them within three or four weeks. So we had some women who were were really in the single digits or the teens, um, so well below the 20 nanograms per ml that the Institute of Medicine lists as the normal level. Um, or at least the level that's um, not deficiency, let's put it that way. And when they were randomized to 4,000, their levels were then, in the next month, had jumped up to the high 80s, low 90s. Now, there was no toxicity found in that. Um, some people might think that it's better to bring up your level gradually. I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I think that you could certainly be more conservative, and um, if you're quite deficient, so levels below 20, you could go to 2,000 IUs a day for a month, and then go up to 4,000. Um, but there's no evidence to suggest um, that um, you know that the other these these doses of 4,000 um, are are going to be toxic, which is what I guess the person is getting at when they say, is it okay? Um, now, we didn't study the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, um, but again, um, other people who have looked at levels, if you, what you're really trying to achieve is a healthy vitamin D level in your, in your body, and whatever dose is necessary to achieve that is what you should take. All right. Number eight, to some extent, is a reiteration. Can vitamin D be prescribed in the first trimester? Is there any harm to the fetus? If you're taking calcium and vitamin D, as the total gets to about 3,000 IU of D3, is it safe? So I think. Um, <coughs> so we did not study the combination of calcium and vitamin D supplements. Uh, I think that what we did find was the really almost almost 100%, um, it was rare. So probably at least 90% of the women in, our, in both of our studies were getting enough calcium through their diet. So in the United States, women are typically not um, having um, issues with calcium, even among our African-American women who may be lactose intolerant at greater risk of that. Um, so I, um, I think that you should really look carefully at what your calcium intake is. And I can only recommend uh, a vitamin D supplement. Um, you know, that's what we studied. Um, and I think that 
these permutations of 1,000 of calcium, 3,000 of vitamin D3, you have to realize that vitamin D has um, effects on the body that are distinct from the calcium metabolic pathway. And that really the vitamin D that, that we're talking about is really the non-calcium. We're looking at the immune function and the modulation of that immune function through vitamin D. And calcium is not a part of that. So I, I would just say there's not a lot of information out there about calcium and vitamin D supplements combined. And I would, I would really enter that path with care. Thank you. Number nine, I read that suggested amount of D is around 4,000 IU. Is it better to take it in one capsule or split it in several doses together with multivitamins or separately or different times? So we studied um, our vitamin D was given once a day. Um, given the half-life of 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which is two to three weeks, and uh, the half-life of vitamin D itself, is about 12 hours. So, what you know, what you're saying is, does it does it really matter? And I think it's really what matters is the steady state of of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So, you know, if you're the kind of person who um, likes to split in several doses, I guess you can do that. I don't think there's a problem with that. But if you it's hard to you to, for you to remember, then I would just take the one. Uh, capsule. There are also gummy bear preparations that are on the market and um, sometimes women when they're pregnant have um, difficulties uh, tolerating the horse pills that might be available. Um, there are some very tiny gel caps. Whatever um, kind of mode of, of vitamin D supplementation agrees with you is, is the one that you should take. Um, as far as pairing it with your multivitamin, I don't see that as a, as a problem. Um, you know, again, if you have an issue with fat malabsorption, if you have cystic fibrosis or one of the um, autoimmune um, GI um, illnesses like uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, then it may be that you do need to split your dosing or modify your intake um, because um, certain... Onwards. We still have some more, Dr. Wagner. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> I think um, the first one we've already answered, but are there certain forms of vitamin D supplements that are preferred for pregnant and breastfeeding women, certain brands or ways? Um, and will there be a webinar about postpartum? Haven't discussed that yet, but... How about the okay. supplements for <clears throat> preferred types? So I, I think that, um, again, it's really a personal um, option. But it should be, the vitamin D should be, m may, you know, that you, that you purchase should be um, made by someone who has quality control. So it, it, it may be that you get a brand that's half the price of some other brand, but you have to make sure that, it is a good a good quality manufacturer. You know they have um, tests in, in place and so forth. Um, I mentioned that the vitamin D3 is the preferred supplement. Um, it's much easier to get. Vitamin D2, <coughs> excuse me, um, appears to have some difference in, in terms of its metabolism. Um, but for those women who are vegetarian, perhaps they would prefer the vitamin D2. Um, because that is uh, plant-based. The vitamin D3 is typically from um, marine, um, you know, based, so from the fish oils. And there are some people who are allergic to fish oils and cannot tolerate the vitamin D3. And so you'd have to look to make sure that the vitamin D3 was, um, you know, that it was separate from the fish oil. So, those are some considerations. And as far as postpartum, um, <clears throat> I would say for breastfeeding, women are studies that we are just um, in the process of now presenting um, and we're hoping to have um, published by the end of this year. Um, breastfeeding uh, women 
um, they they give about 20% of their vitamin D is is given to their baby through their milk. Uh, and they, we've studied the vitamin D3. Um, we've also studied vitamin D2. Um, but the levels that we achieved of the 25 hydroxy vitamin D were less than what we found with the vitamin D3. Um, and um, clearly, that's another discussion for another webinar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, similar type question here. If someone already has optimal levels, can a dose of 5,000 IU be taken once weekly instead of daily? Well, for, for those of us who are in the vitamin D field as, as clinicians, we really um, prefer to see daily intake because it it's it's more physiologic and if you where we evolved around the equator um, you are having sunlight exposure and a daily dose of vitamin D now it's true that you can take higher amounts of vitamin D weekly to achieve on average and again this is the point on average what you would get when you took a daily dose of 4000 IU however um, it's really what you're seeing are these wide fluctuations with very significant peaks and then gradually decreasing. And we feel that the daily dose is the preferred, more physiologic um, way of giving vitamin D. Um, for breastfeeding, it's absolutely essential because what's transferred in the milk is not your 25-hydroxy vitamin D, but rather the vitamin D. So you would have the baby getting a huge dose through your breast milk after taking the larger dose, and then it would continue to fall. So by the, you know, the end of that week, the seventh day before you took your next pill, you'd have really very, very low levels of um, vitamin D being transferred to the baby. Um, so for these reasons, we recommend daily dosing. Mm -hmm. Number 12, if a pregnant woman tests low in the first trimester, does she need to take more than 4,000 IU of vitamin D to achieve a beneficial level through the remainder of her pregnancy? So we had women who had profound deficiency, and they were on the 4,000 IU per day. And within a month, their levels really had um, achieved um, you know, m marked improvement. And so we really, at this point, um, would recommend, you know, just the daily um, amount of 4,000. Now, other people have looked at um, giving women in their seventh month of pregnancy a very large dose, you know, talking about 50,000 IUs um, at one time and then followed them. Again, you've got that kind of peak and then and trough. Um, it may be that some women are going to need more than 4,000 IU, particularly if they have a, lar you know, a higher BMI and if they have malabsorption. And so in conjunction with an informed physician um, or health practitioner, um, you could certainly figure out what was needed to achieve a normal level. But for um, the vast majority of women, 4,000 will be is fine. And again, if a woman is planning on getting pregnant, she should correct her vitamin D deficiency before she gets pregnant. Dr. Wagner, in our study and several others, it takes vitamin D or the stabilization or the plateauing of the level takes about three months to get there. Like you start taking your supplement today and you certainly start going up rather quickly, but it doesn't really reach its uh, final level until about three months. Did you observe anything differently during the pregnancy? We did actually, and so women <clears throat> reached their steady state by um, they were, you know, much improved by one month, and by two months they were at steady state. Really, and it That's may great. have to do with the um, pregnant woman's um, metabolism. All right. Thank you. Uh, number 13, 6400 IU for pregnant women should translate into what serum level? Well, so it depends if that woman's also, you know, tandem nursing if she's pregnant and breastfeeding. But let's assume she's not. So if you look at the grid, if 4000 gets you to 40 to 50, um, 
you would expect that 6400 IUs would probably get a woman to 70 or 80 nanograms per ml. And again, it also depends on you know what time frame are you talking about and duration of that therapy. We're not recommending 6400 IUs for the pregnant woman um, unless she has specific health requirements and she has um, you know is, is, that she's been tested. Mm -hmm. The appropriate dosing, what are the dangers of too much? And is there any effect on depression with vitamin D? So certainly there's uh, dangers of too much. So it's documented throughout the literature um, through the last century of what happens when you have excessive amount of vitamin D. Um, we know that um, levels of well above 100, maybe even above 200 nanograms per ml, um, are, are really um, what it takes to be having too much. But um, you're talking about at least more than 10,000 international units a day. And um, there are some studies that show that if you have stepwise increases, even up to 40,000 IUs a day, that that's tolerated and not associated with the leading <coughs> dangers of too much vitamin D is hypercalcemia, so you you're, um, you start spilling calcium in your urine, and then you overwhelm your kidneys, and you can get um, certainly you basically turn to stone. Um, you start then you start getting increases in your serum calcium. Um, I would um, you know I would say that most people would would aim for um, a serum level below 100 nanograms per ml. But on the other hand, um, we've certainly had women who've had levels above 100 without any problems. And I think if you look at the um, individuals who come from uh, sun-rich environments where they're spending hours a day um, in sunlight, um, what you find is some, some of those individuals will have levels um, of 120, 140 nanograms per ml. Um, most people. Um, though in that sun-rich environment will have levels somewhere in the 60 to 80 nanogram per ml range. Um, as far as effect on depression, um, there's some suggestion that vitamin D um, plays a role in seasonal affective disorder. Um, we looked at it in our cohort of lactating women, and although preliminary data showed some um, a weak association in a larger cohort, we did not find um, that did not hold up. And it may very well be that we were selecting for women who were not depressed um, because to enter a study, um, <clears throat> you, uh, such as what we had, our lactation study where they were followed for six months, women who are depressed would be more likely to say no. So I think the verdict is not quite in on that. There certainly is some um, evidence from the neurosciences that vitamin D, there are receptors uh, for vitamin D in the brain, and we certainly also have to think about vitamin D and the role of, of sunlight and ultraviolet light. And it may be that some aspects of vitamin D that are, are attributed to, to it its in the brain may actually has something to do with um, the sunlight itself. So I think that, that there needs to be more um, data uh, accumulating on that topic. One of the things that we have noted also in the grassroots health study about the dosing and the dangers of too much is that above a certain level, um, right actually when you get to be in the 40 or 50 nanogram per milliliter range, it is really hard to get your serum level up to, say, 200 nanograms per milliliter. Each incremental 1,000 IU you take only raises your serum level a couple of nanograms per milliliter. So the effect of vitamin D on raising that, or supplements at least, on raising that level decreases the higher you get. So it is not a major tragedy. You should test. You should pay attention to where you're going. Um, but it's not very common. 
And that's it for this week's questions. Thank you so much to Dr. Carol Wagner and Carol Baggerly for um, that interview and providing those answers. Before we close, I'd like for you to be aware of a vitamin D and pregnancy frequently asked questions brochure that we have made available on our website for you to refer to, download, print, and share. You can find it at grassrootshealth.net forward slash FAQ pregnancy, or simply go to the documentations tab on our website. Um, and please join us for next week's webinar with Dr. Matthew Mizwicki, who will be addressing his recent findings on how vitamin D relates to Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative neurodegenerative disorders. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you to all of you who are participants in our D Action program. Your support makes these webinars possible. So for more information on the D Action program or to join yourself and order your own vitamin D test kit please visit grassrootshealth.net or go to joindeaction.org. Thank you again for attending and have a great day.